Good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members <coughs> using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure that they're switched to silent. Apologies have been received today from Lewis MacDonald, Tavish Scott and Jackson Carlow and I'd like to welcome Dean Lockhart who will be substituting for Jackson to the meeting. Our first item of business today is an evidence session on the committee's immigration inquiry with the Minister for International Development and Europe, Alistair Allen. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the Minister and his officials um, for coming to give evidence today. Uh, we have Rachel S Sunderland, the team leader of EU Strategy and Migration, and Angela Hallam, the principal research officer uh, with the Scottish Government. Um, Minister, would you like to make an opening statement? Thank you, Convener. I'll be brief, but um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to contribute uh, today to your uh, inquiry uh, on uh, immigration. Uh, as I think the committee will agree, Scotland is a progressive and outward-looking country and we recognise that migration strengthens our society uh, and our nation benefits from the skills and the experience and the expertise of uh, those individuals who've chosen to work or to study in Scotland. It's been clear for some time that the one-size-fits-all approach to immigration policy in the United Kingdom isn't sustainable uh, in the future in the face of very different economic, demographic and social needs across the UK and I hope that we can actually continue to find some degree of common ground across the parties uh, on that issue in Scotland. So the Scottish Government welcomes inquiries uh, like this that recognise the potential need for, for regional variations in the migration system uh, to ensure that uh, the system serves Scotland's needs. Uh, the committee will have seen a response to the UK's Migration Advisory Committee published yesterday which sets out the evidence base for why Scotland's needs are different from the rest of the UK and I hope this will also be helpful to uh, yourselves. As I highlighted um, in my response to this committee as part of the uh, commitment outlined in the Scottish Government's programme for government, we will be publishing a discussion paper setting out why it is vital to our economy to be able to attract talent from across Europe and the world, why current UK government policy does not meet uh, Scotland's interests on this issue, uh, and how a more flexible approach um, with more power uh, for Scotland on this issue uh, could operate. So I hope that's a helpful introduction, uh, and I, I'm needless to say, very happy to answer your questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. As you know, uh, Minister, this committee has... Uh, published its own report uh, on uh, immigration and citizens' rights um, after taking a considerable amount of evidence uh, earlier uh, in the year. Uh, some of the evidence that, that we took certainly reflects what you're talking about in terms of the skills gap and the contribution that immigrants make to our society. Um, and another rather overarching uh, factor, uh, a challenge facing Scotland that our report uh, highlighted was the, the difference in working age population uh, and, um, and older people uh, if we don't have immigration. And I was noticing in your own submission uh, to the MAC on page 26, it <coughs> says that Scotland is projected to have the second largest decrease uh, of 1.5% in working age population. Um, again, overall regions between 2014 <coughs> and 2024. And but at the same time, the population aged over 65 is expected to grow by 20%. That, what kind of challenge does that, that pose to our public services in that we have so many more people <coughs> over working age and a predicted decrease in the number of people who are paying taxes? Well, I should preface what I say by welcoming the fact that we are likely or hopefully likely to, to live longer in Scotland yeah. and that there is an increase in, in our uh, uh, age, uh, our life expectancy. Um, but you, you make a very fair point. Um, and in fact, the, the figures, if you look at the figures over the next 25 years, they're, they're even um, more pronounced. Um, the, the expectation is that, that over the next 25 years, the population aged over 75 it will increase by some 79%. Now, that, as I say, is to be welcomed, but um, the only reason that we're able to sustain this, this situation in Scotland is by, by increasing the number of people of working age who are in our society. And um, 
if you look at the projections for what would happen uh, in a scenario where we didn't have uh, people coming from other countries uh, to live uh, in this country, then the number of people in the working age population would go down by 3%. And indeed, our, our population overall would flatten. <coughs> so we have a, an ageing demographic. But I think what's distinctive about Scotland's situation is it is much, much more pronounced than the situation for the rest of the UK. Over the next few years, uh, in fact, over the next 20, 10 years and over the next 25 years, 100% of the reason why our population will go up is because of the fact that we have people coming from other countries. That's 50% in the UK overall. But 100% of the reason why our population will go up is because of people coming here from other countries. And yeah, that's exactly what our, what our report showed as well, the, the crisis um, facing uh, the country if we don't have a supply of migrants. Is, is, are there any alternatives to uh, new people coming? Well, it should, it should be said that we obviously want to, to try to address the skills gaps that there are in the Scottish economy by skilling people up, and we, we seek to do that. Um, we, we put a lot of effort as a society into making sure that educational and training opportunities are there and that, that jobs are being filled. But we have relatively high employment uh, in Scotland, uh, relatively low unemployment. There is not a, a huge pool of people who can step in to take the places um, of jobs which are, are currently filled by migrants. Um, um, for instance, I can, you'll be more than familiar uh, with the sectors because I think you, you named them in your, your own report and your own study, but there are many sectors which simply could not fill uh, the places uh, that are currently filled by migrants from some other uh, mysterious source. Yes. Um, how, the, the, your document is quite a substantial um, uh, contribution to the, the UK government's evidence gathering through the Migration Advisory Committee, but I know that the, the Migration Advisory Committee's report that the UK government has asked it to produce is, is not going to be coming out until next September, whereas we're going to have an immigration bill published long before that. So how realistically are you going to be able to influence UK government policy if the, if the report you're contributing to doesn't come out until next September? Well, it is a very interesting question, uh, one that would have to be posed in a way, uh, as a, I, think, I think certainly the Scottish government has done, posed to, to the UK government why they are um, proposing a, a process which will extend, in terms of the, 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 the MAC itself, a process which will extend almost certainly, as you say, long beyond um, the, the date at which uh, legislation will be brought in by the UK government on the issue of, of immigration. It's difficult to see uh, how the MAC findings will influence um, the, the legislation at UK government uh, level in question. But we do seek, uh, as a Scottish government, to influence not just through the MAC, but through, through other routes as well, um, through the joint ministerial committees that exist um, between the devolved administrations and the UK when they meet. Um, we do seek to uh, influence the UK government um, both privately and publicly about what we have as real concerns. They're not merely political points. They are real workforce planning concerns about how we plan for the future uh, in Scotland unless we make it very clear to people uh, that they really are welcome and that they really are needed. Obviously, there was quite a lot of cross-party consensus on this issue in the past, and uh, I believe it was the previous Labour government that brought in the post-study work visa for Scotland, which was then uh, became a UK-wide thing and then was abolished. And it was quite noteworthy that when the present government did a, uh, a pilot for bringing it back, Scotland wasn't included, despite you know, our cross-party consensus asking for a return of the post-study work visa as one of the most, uh, well, probably the only kind of significant example of Scotland having differentiation in these areas. I mean, given that... Uh, behaviour in the past, how likely is it that you can bring pressure to bear for a differentiated system in Scotland? Well, the, the example you, you point to there with the post-study work visa, I don't think I've ever seen anything that has attracted quite so much consensus in Scotland. Things don't generally attract consensus in Scotland, um, but you had the whole university sector, you had uh, the whole business um, sector, private and public, the political world across the political spectrum, 
all saying the same thing. And I'm sorry to say, but despite many efforts all being um, rebuffed on this question, um, there is no doubt about the fact that the, the benefits which the, uh, the post-study work visa system provided for the university sector, for the wider economy in Scotland, were, were really undeniable. Um, we continue to make that argument, and we have certainly very publicly expressed our disappointment that the four, I think, universities in the UK which were um, chosen to take part in a pilot, none of them um, were in Scotland, and um, therefore it is disappointing that that, that argument has, has so far not been heeded within, within the UK government. But I do, nonetheless, despite that list of criticisms of the UK government, want to try and find common ground within this parliament to continue to make the argument in a positive way um, for these things to happen um, and <coughs> the, the, the role of the committee in doing that is very helpful. Yeah. Uh, our committee took evidence from uh, the Quebec government on uh, how uh, a differentiated immigration system uh, can work perfectly well um, in a, uh, from s with regional governments or sub-national governments and there are examples of that elsewhere such as in Switzerland uh, that we've examined. Um, is that something that uh, you think is possible to achieve? I think it's eminently possible to achieve. In fact, I would go further than that and say it's necessary to achieve it. Uh, for the reasons I've given to do with our demography and our economy, it is necessary that we find um, a solution that's tailored to Scotland's needs. Now, the, the, example, the examples you quote are rightly examples where at a, a sub-state level there is a, a degree of flexibility on, on immigration policy. They're all very different immigration policies, it should be said. Australia has a very different kind of uh, migration policy to that in Canada or to that in Switzerland, but they all share the principle, which is that there is a political will to allow these things to happen at a, a sub-state level. Um, and although this may sound like I'm going off at a tangent, that the fact that the UK government is, is now seeding certain arguments about how the post-Brexit world might work in Northern Ireland, um, the fact that we're even talking about uh, Northern Ireland in a new way in this context shows that where there is a will, it can be done, and it can be done quite successfully. And I really don't understand the argument that it couldn't be done successfully within the United Kingdom uh, with regards to Scotland. Thank you. Uh, Richard Lockhead. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. I'll just pick up on the convener's uh, closing remark there, uh, or question. What do you think is the real reason why the UK government are opposing the devolution of immigration powers to Scotland, given the disproportionate challenge we face demographically? <laughs> well, I, I will unavoidably have to give some political answers to that, um, that question. Uh, at the moment, they, they seem to simply be of the view that um, immigration policy is, is indivisible for, for political or doctrinal reasons. Um, and... Uh, I would like to think that at some point they will listen to reason on this, certainly that they will listen to the, the broader view, the consensus view in the Scottish Parliament that we need to do something else. But um, you would have to ask them, but they, they have not been willing to move. Okay, well clearly there's a lot of unity in Scotland and I noticed that even Alistair Darling, the head of the, the No campaign in the 2014 referendum, indicates he now supports some kind of differentiated policy in, in Scotland for immigration, so hopefully... Um, that unity will continue and have an impact on the UK government. I've got a couple of cases in my constituency I just want to raise because I want to know if there's a role for the Scottish Government to help uh, lobby the UK government even more than we are just now and, and try and influence decisions at the Home Office because, uh, as you may know, the shortage of teachers in Murray is well documented mm -hmm. and publicised. And there's also a well-publicised case in my constituency in the last few weeks where a Heather Katanich, a, a woman from Canada, uh, was working in a school in Forest, And then, of course, she wasn't able to get the visa uh, sorted out. Uh, and she had to leave that post. And there's been a lot of publicity around that, that case, even though she's married to a Scot. I've got another case at the same time where a woman from America is registered with the General Teaching Council in Scotland uh, and she's desperate to work in a Murray school, but we can't get her a sponsored visa because for some reason I think Murray Council will only sponsor STEM subjects. So we have the situation in Murray, to give one example of one part of Scotland, where the demographic challenge is even more challenging than the Scottish national challenge because the number of pensionable age people is set to increase by 33% over the next 25 years, with the working age population going down 
We have young people wanting to live and work in Murray and other parts of Scotland, uh, fulfil, uh, take, take on posts where there's a current shortage, and yet we can't get them the visas to work in this country. It's a ridiculous situation. It's damaging our economy, uh, our future, uh, and indeed our education system. I just wonder, do you think there's a, more of a role the Scottish Government could play to try and address some of these cases? Well, we certainly do try to highlight uh, some of these cases, and I, I would absolutely agree with the, the concerns that you're, you're voicing uh, more generally about that. Uh, and I think that one of the one of the problems in all this, um, if I can speak more generally to begin with, rather than about education specifically, is that the target that the UK government for many years has set itself around reducing uh, net migration or net inward migration to the tens of thousands uh, is, I think, having a, a completely distorting effect on um, on every aspect of of, of, uh, of migration policy. Then becomes a slave to this target. Uh, and regardless of the merits of individual cases, regardless of the, the merits of uh, individual sectors, uh, everything becomes a slave to this target. And it should be said that if we stick to this target, um, the demographics for Scotland become quite frightening. Um, that's before we even consider the possibility of, of actual, you know, theoretical nil inward migration. Even if we stick to that target, the, the prospects for Scotland become uh, quite frightening. Um, for education, uh, you're quite right to say that in some parts of Scotland in particular, um, there is a, a real issue and, and uh, Murray is, is one of those. We want to see teachers from other countries uh, making their, their homes and their, their careers and their jobs in, in Scotland. Uh, we, we do seek to help where we can on that. We don't have any power uh, over the individual cases when it comes to um, the, the authorities in the UK, but we do seek to raise their cases and I'm very happy to raise them again. My final question is, the statistics that you've outlined in, in relation to our demographic challenge as a country are, are eye-watering, and I wonder what more the Scottish Government can do to convey to the people of Scotland just how big this challenge is, because clearly it's a statistical-based argument, and therefore because it relates to statistics it's quite difficult to, to uh, raise awareness, and therefore I wonder if the government could go away and maybe just think of more ways in which we can really publicise the demographic challenge in facing this country and the implications for our future as a country. I think you're right to say that it's going to be about more than statistics. It's got to be about a kind of hearts and minds argument that will have to be made over this. I think there is a broader understanding than sometimes is given credit for in the media in Scotland about what this problem is. But for instance, yesterday I was in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary um, talking about the fact that without the contribution that is made by uh, European citizens living in Scotland, the, the NHS in Scotland would face a real problem. Uh, I think that is the kind of hearts and minds argument we can make uh, about uh, the importance, uh, uh, not just demographically, but the importance to our public services uh, that is represented by EU citizens. Uh, and I am mindful not to try and uh, raise false fears about this issue. Um, I am, we are doing our best to work with the UK government to find solutions. But it must be said that every time I and other ministers engage with people, whether they are in the health service or other sectors uh, who are from other European countries, they, they have had real concerns over the last year and more. Uh, it is very difficult to make financial plans for yourself or your family. It is very difficult to make plans for a mortgage. It is very difficult to make plans for a business when there is so much uncertainty surrounding you. So yes, we do have to make that argument and we will make it, and we'll make it with more than statistics. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Good morning, Minister. Um, would you say that Scotland's needs are not so different from the rest of the UK that would justify devolving control over immigration? And also, um, if we look at the needs of uh, soft fruit producers in Angus and cherry growers in Herefordshire, uh, do you not believe that they have the same requirement for seasonal migrant labour? And would you agree that Scotland's needs were almost identical to the rest of the UK's needs? Right, well, firstly, no, I wouldn't agree that our, our needs are identical to, to the rest of the UK for the, the reasons I've been trying to set out, which is that um, demographically our situation is twice as extreme as the situation in the rest of the UK. So, no, I don't agree with that point. On, on the question of whether soft fruit, fruit growers have the same uh, workforce planning issues, uh, uh, whether they're not Angus or Herefordshire, I'm not disputing that the nature of the business is similar. It is possible, however, to argue that 
for some regions and certainly for, for Scotland, these, these industries have a particular uh, importance. But the point I am making is that the situation demographically for Scotland will be twice as bad if we don't get it sorted. Okay, so on that point, um, why is Scotland not attracting a higher share of migrants? And only 3.4% of Scotland's population is from the EU, compared with 4.9% across the UK as a whole. Well, I don't know where you get that figure from with respect, but the, the figure I have is that it's roughly 7%, uh, and that that's roughly in line with our population share. Okay. Um, another question I want to ask you is about the Migration Advisory Committee. And am I right in saying that the this committee provides independent advice to ministers on the skills that should be included on the UK's uh, shortage occupation list. Um, the Migration Advisory Committee also reviews the list after consulting Scottish employers, and there is a separate list of job titles and occupations for Scotland, um, and that allows employers to recruit migrants into jobs officially in shortage without the need first to conduct a resident labour market test. So, is it not true that the Scottish list had mostly matched the UK version? Well, yeah, certainly, we, we do seek to influence uh, the, the list, um, and we, we, have, we have done that. But um, uh, you know, it is, isn't entirely easy. Um, um, when, for instance, the, the, um, the MAC opened its, its consultation on this, it was very difficult to get information from them and numerous meetings that were um, offered with ministers and others um, were reneged on. However, we do seek to, um, at a government level, I should say, not at a committee level, but um, we do nonetheless engage with them. We, we do put forward evidence. Um, yes, it's true to say that the lists are, are broadly similar, but we have put forward um, our, own, our own ideas on, on different sectors, uh, and we do seek to influence that where we can. But the problem is that this is a workforce-wide issue, and without <laughs> returning and labouring the whole point about the benefits and the freedom of movement, we, we cannot really solve this problem in Scotland by, by purely looking at it on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. There is a need for a much wider um, openness to people from other countries living here, or our demographic problem is not going to be solved. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just in a supplementary to that question by Rachel Hamilton, I noted that COSLA, who contributed uh, evidence to our committee's research, explained that it had been engaging with MAC for many years, and just to quote them, it said, to date had little success in influencing the shortage occupation list for Scotland. Well, the, the, there are frustrations around this. I mean, as I said, the, you pointed yourself to one of the, the, the major frustrations, which is that, um, without any disrespect to the MAC itself, it, it is clearly unlikely to influence the big decisions that are going to be made by the UK uh, about uh, immigration policy, uh, given the timescales that have been set for it. Um, and one of the, the others is the one you point to, which is that it is, it is, not, it is far from simple for anybody in Scotland, far far uh, less the, the Scottish Government to have a, any direct influence uh, upon that policy um, at all. So these are the frustrations. We have to try to find a way through it. And I think the more we can speak with one voice in this and, and indicate that Scotland has different interests and that they should be listened to the better. Thank you. Mary Gujan. Oh, yeah, it was just really to, to follow on from the convener's direct point, because that was something that uh, stuck out to me as well, the evidence that was put forward by COSLA. But it was also in terms of uh, the UK's tier two immigration framework, because if EA citizens are subject to that criteria, I believe that COSLA had, had said that the, the minimum wage thresholds for that would effectively remove all people working in social care and health where we need, where we do need those spaces filled. And it was just really to, to, get, your, to get your views on that and how we can overcome those issues when we have sectors like that where we do need uh, people to come and work here uh, to, fill, to, fill the gaps, to fill the gaps in that market. That, that's certainly true of that sector. It's true of other sectors as well, uh, like the one that was mentioned around agriculture and the fruit industry and, and many others as well. Uh, if I may, I may call upon officials to answer your specific point about some of those issues. Um, yes, happy to do so. Oh. Sorry. Happy to do so. I mean, I think the concern is that obviously the the current system for non-EU nationals coming in is um, skills and salary based, 
the evidence that we've presented in the report that we published yesterday clearly demonstrates the positive impact that EU nationals are having in a wide range of sectors. And the risk is that once you put a, sector, a, a scale or a salary um, in place, then actually there are significant sectors which will be disadvantaged, including, for example, um, volunteers. Um, and we have an example of the Camp Hill, um, which is very dependent upon volunteers. So there are big concerns there as well. And also, that is quite a bureaucratic and lengthy process, whereas what um, businesses and employers are saying is what they want is something which is quite fluid, is easy and very responsive. Okay, thank you. Um, also in evidence, another point from Unison was about, uh, uh, similar to that of course, it was influencing changes to the, the Scottish occupation list. And it, they had raised an issue about the format of supporting evidence that is presented to the MAC. And apparently it's formatted in a way that they don't find acceptable. And, that, and they'd said that the MAC had argued that they find it difficult to get evidence about shortages in Scotland in the format it requires. How do we overcome that kind of issue if, it's, if they say it's a, a formatting problem when clearly evidence is there about the shortages that we have? Well, again, with respect, if it's about the form, I may, I may defer to the officials about that, but yet clearly we don't want to, to get ourselves into a situation where uh, there isn't that flow of information, but I, I'm afraid I will, have to, I will have to call upon help for that one. That's fine. Um, I think our experience, and we've certainly had feedback from the Migration Advisory Committee, that sometimes they are taking a very economic focused approach to this, and they are looking particularly for hard evidence at a sector level. I think the evidence that we published yesterday does provide a lot of that. I think previously, the type of evidence that has been able to be provided um, has maybe been softer evidence, has been anecdotal evidence. Um, so I think there, sometimes there is a miss, there has been a mismatch between the nature of the evidence that the Migration Advisory Committee has been looking for, but the report that we published yesterday does pull a lot of that together very clearly. And does the Scottish Government believe that there should be Scottish representation on the MAC? Yes, I think it would, it would be helpful if we had more direct representation uh, on the MAC in, in future. I think it would also be helpful, um, much as it is useful to look at sector by sector approaches, I think it, it is important to look at nation by nation or region by region approaches as well. And I think that um, by conceding in a way the, the idea of the political debate at UK level seems to have conceded the idea um, of, of uh, different approaches on immigration for different sectors, it does beg the question why it can't be done on a, a national or, or regional or a sub-state level as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, earlier on in your contribution, <coughs> uh, you spoke about the, the situation regarding the, the, the powers. And the, in your uh, document that we received yesterday, uh, which I... Oh, here we go. Uh, in your document yesterday, on page 48, um, there's the, 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 the issue regarding international students um, and that they, that they should not be included in the, the net migration target. Um, now, as somebody who studied uh, in Europe uh, through an Erasmus scheme, uh, it's something that, uh, and I hosted an event here a couple of weeks ago uh, regarding the 30 years of the Erasmus Plus uh, scheme. So I genuinely understand how important uh, the issue of uh, EU students coming here and also us going to the EU it really is in terms of uh, that cultural exchange. Uh, so in terms of the, uh, uh, what the government have actually suggested regarding the, uh, the, the, the policy area and to the MAC, um, how important uh, does the, do you and also the Scottish Government actually place the issue of international students actually coming, uh, to, coming to Scotland, but also having that opportunity to contribute uh, to the Scottish economy afterwards uh, if they have the chance to stay? Well, I think, I think it's right to, bo to point both to the economic and the, the cultural benefit. Uh, the, the economic benefit is clear, not just our um, university and, and college sector, but also um, to the fact that many of these people bring uh, their skills and are willing to, to live in Scotland afterwards or to work in Scotland uh, after they, they graduate. But the point you're making about the, um, the inclusion of, 
of students within the 100,000 um, figure or the 100,000 net migration figure is a very important one too because uh, I think there is, unlike in, in the UK um, political scene, there is, a, as, as I understand it, uh, a political consensus across all the parties um, that students should not be included in this figure. I've mentioned why I don't think the figure is tremendously helpful um, for migration policy as it affects Scotland more generally. But I, I would like to think that whatever our differences, my understanding from statements from all the parties is that we, we do agree that students should not be included in that figure because it, it totally distorts uh, our understanding of migration policy and distorts our understanding of the benefits that, that students from other countries bring to us. Uh, and certainly, and also, the, the, the Scottish Government explains that uh, it's preparing the, this evidence-based paper on immigration. Uh, but how will you take into account any evidence that, uh, that you hear from this committee uh, in, in considering putting your paper together? Uh, the Scottish Government will be more than happy to take on board uh, evidence that this, this committee has produced. This committee has produced some substantial papers uh, around the issue of uh, um, uh, migration policy as it affects Scotland, that the task that we are now faced with is to imagine what uh, a distinctive, a tailored, uh, a differentiated, how, whichever word you want to use, uh, solution for Scotland would actually look like in, in policy terms. We've made clear our preferred solution, which is the freedom of movement of people um, throughout Europe, um, uh, including Scotland. Um, but we now also have to think about, well, what, what would a differentiated solution for Scotland look like? Uh, what would be the, the policy options, the policy levers that we might use if we had constitutionally the, the power to use them? Um, we are not in a position, or I'm not in a position to, to set that out for you today. Um, uh, in the coming months, however, I, I will be more than willing to come back to this committee to, to talk about our proposals as they develop. And yes, I would be very happy indeed to take on board uh, any uh, views, any uh, recommendations that this, this committee has in that area. Already this morning, uh, Minister, that, uh, you've touched upon the issue of, uh, of Brexit. And certainly this uh, Parliament has had uh, various UK ministers uh, come to, the, to various committees uh, to answer questions regarding you know, the issue of Brexit and how it's going to affect uh, this Parliament. And certainly yesterday, um, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, had uh, Robin Walker MP and also Chris Skidmore MP uh, come to give evidence. Both are obviously ministers in the UK government. And they, I mean, this is all on the record, and they were extremely... Um, uh, not re well, repetitive is probably too strong a word, but uh, they consistently made the point that they are in listening mode. They want to, to come to Scotland to talk to and also to listen, uh, so that uh, uh, they can take, part, take back issues and, uh, and then hopefully make some uh, changes. Now, with that, you've already touched upon this morning that you find it uh, difficult to, uh, well, for the UK government to actually listen to uh, recommendations from the Scottish government. Now, how, how much of a challenge uh, is the Scottish Government actually finding that with the UK Government uh, for them to consider uh, some, uh, whether it's a differentiated approach for Scotland or uh, some other type of approach in terms of immigration for Scotland? Well, since, since the Brexit vote, we, we've tried to put forward a whole series of, of compromise proposals, and there, there's no point in, in rehearsing the, the different, different political perspectives which we'll all have on all those solutions. But the point is, it has been no simple task. Uh, the joint ministerial committee, there are two, one on European negotiations and one on which I sit on Europe. Um, you know, one didn't sit for, I think, eight months. Um, they are convened by the UK government, I should say. You know, we are working to try and make these, um, these, these bodies work so that we, we do try to, to uh, exchange ideas, that we do try to, to work with each other um, I have an outstanding meeting request um, with the, the UK Immigration Minister. Uh, I do seek <laughs> to, to make sure that these meetings happen. Uh, but I would not like to give you the picture that the UK government has in the past seen its role as more than informing us of what it is doing. I mean, there has been a suggestion um, that, uh, uh, of a potential uh, GMC on immigration. Is that something that you would welcome? Well, I, I would welcome any kind of uh, 
engagement. I wouldn't say that the, the Joint Ministerial Committee model has been the most successful attempt ever devised uh, to include the devolved administrations uh, in, uh, in the, the workings of, of, of UK policy. Um, I certainly wouldn't be against anything uh, that, uh, that tried to to try to promote that conversation. So I certainly, I certainly wouldn't oppose it if it was meaningful, uh, if it had a proper um, secretariat, if it had proper regular meetings, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ross Creer. Thanks, Convener. <coughs> the um, sectoral issues that we have in, in terms of uh, attracting inward migration and, and filling skill shortages have been covered, but obviously these issues, the demographic issues we have with ageing populations are quite geographically acute as well. What tools uh, does the Scottish Government currently have? What <coughs> tools do you currently employ to ensure an effective geographic dispersal, distribution of, of those coming in? I don't mean to use language that makes people sound simply like units of labour, but there is obviously a, a need, particularly in uh, rural areas, the Fries and Galway in particular has very acute needs. What tools does the government employ to ensure that people are, are attracted to these areas? I think, I think you're right to say that it's, it's about attracting people rather than moving people right around. I think, I think we're uh, of one view on that. I, I represent uh, the Western Isles in Parliament and I'm very conscious both of the fact that our population as a region is set to come down by 14% over the next 25 years. Um, but I'm also conscious of the fact that many uh, communities in my area, as in Dumfries and Galloway, I'm sure, uh, have benefited enormously from people from other European countries making it their home. I can think of communities um, in rural Scotland where the school is probably open um, largely because of the fact that that community has got people working in it from other European countries. There are particular sectors in rural Scotland, whether it's fish processing, whether to some, to some degree the fishing industry, certain types of agriculture, as we've talked about, are very, very important. And, and we, should, um, we should make sure that we, we make um, rural Scotland attractive um, to people who are coming from other countries. Perhaps the most important thing we can do uh, uh, overall, however, is to make it clear again and again and again to people that they are welcome. Um, people um, do feel welcome in their communities, particularly in rural Scotland, but they also need us as politicians uh, to repeat that message over and over again. And what role do you see for local government in this? Because we've discussed the, the need for differentiated solutions within the UK. There's obviously a need for a level of differentiation within Scotland. What role would you see for local government within that? Well, as I say, we're going to come forward with proposals as to how we could see a differentiated solution working, and I'm very open to looking at, at solutions which take account of the issues you mentioned about the fact that different parts of Scotland have very different needs. So that's something that we will want to be looking at and including uh, in, in that exercise and when we look at what uh, a differentiated immigration policy could look like. So yes, we need to take account of some of those issues when we do that. In terms of local government, local government have, uh, on a completely different subject, it should be said, but but local government have, I think, in Scotland shown themselves to be very helpful and very positive in their contribution uh, towards volunteering to, to, to provide services to refugees, which is a completely different issue, I know. Um, but I'm sure that local government will similarly be involved in the process when it comes to thinking about how we make sure we have a policy um, for European citizens that fits the needs of, of local economies. COSLA have obviously been very engaged on, on this issue for some time. Were they involved at all in contributing towards your response to the, the Migration Advisory Council? Well, we work closely with COSLA's migration team. Uh, we're in touch with them on a very regular basis. Um, we would certainly want to have their views, as I mentioned, when it comes to as we develop our policy uh, in the future. But yes, we, we work with them on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. Dean Lockhart. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener, and good morning, Minister. Uh, I wanted to follow up on a couple of points on the Tier 2 uh, shortage occupation list. Um, at the moment, there are two additional occupations, I understand, for Scotland, um, medical practitioners in some areas and physical scientists. Um, can you talk us through any plans the Scottish Government has to propose additional shortage occupations specifically for Scotland? And can you also talk us through... The, the process, the evidence, the analysis you do to identify what those uh, specific areas are for Scotland? Well, we have, we have done some studies on this, but I mean, for instance, when I was in, um, the, when I was visiting the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary yesterday, the message that came across loud and clear there was that 
yes, that there is a certain amount that can be done to, to identify new sectors or additional areas of work, but the need is across the, the board. Um, for instance, I was in uh, the medical physics department at the, 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 um, the hospital yesterday, and they were saying that the variety of specialisms is so wide, and the specialisms are so specialist, that almost drawing up a list would be beside the point. That's not to take away from the fact that the list is important, but our needs are so wide and so general that we need to have, uh, as Rachel said, a system that's responsive to everyone and is fluid. Okay. Will you expect to put uh, forward um, other additional specific occupations for, for Scotland? If, if, we, if we have evidence that there are specific shortages, then, then as a government we're more than happy to put forward uh, additional areas um, if we have the evidence for that. Okay, thank you. Just a couple of other questions, if, if I can. Um, can you talk us through any plans for the Scottish Government to prepare an annual population strategy for Scotland? Well, we have a wider population strategy uh, as things stand. I'm going to look to Rachel to see what the most recent date was of uh, providing that to Parliament. But uh, um, we, certainly, we certainly have an ongoing population policy. I'm talking about it just now. We've, we've provided evidence to the committee uh, and the... We have also, um, we have also uh, the population strategy for Scotland uh, in the national performance framework, which includes a target uh, to match our population growth uh, for the EU15 average. So our, our population policy is essentially uh, built around the EU15 average, and uh, we regularly make statements and, and comment about how, we're, how, as a country, we're meeting that. As, as part of that, uh, or, or maybe in addition to that, what plans do you have in place to promote Scotland uh, as a destination for migrants across the world, obviously uh, beyond uh, the European Union? And are there particular countries that you would, the Scottish Government would be uh, looking to promote Scotland as a destination within those countries? Well, there, there are obviously particular countries outside the EU with, with whom we have a, a strong association, whether it's historically or anything else. I mean, for instance, it was noticeable um, with the post-study work visa and the, the changes to that or the, or the abolition of that, that uh, I think Nigeria, surprisingly, um, featured as a, as a country where the changes that were made to the, the post-study work visa resulted in, a, in the halving of the number of people from that uh, country coming uh, to study and, and uh, perhaps work in Scotland. So there are obviously countries with which we have a, a particular connection. Perhaps more uh, obvious ones that leap to mind are, are countries with which we have familial connections in Australia and Canada and New Zealand and so forth. But by far the, the biggest immediate source um, of, uh, uh, apart from within the UK itself, by far, by the, far the biggest source of, of new people coming to Scotland is from the European Union. Thank you. And just one final question. Uh, you mentioned other steps that might be uh, taken by the government to address uh, shortages within Scotland uh, and, and looking at the Scottish workforce and um, availability within Scotland. There are, I think, 730,000 economically inactive people in Scotland of working age. Uh, do you see and what plans do you have to uh, possibly look at bringing those people into the workplace to address work workplace shortages? Well, I think, I might be wrong, I, I think the figure you're quoting will include students, for instance. It will include people who are, also include people who are ill. So uh, I'm not sure I would recognise that figure completely, although I'm, I'm happy to go away and, 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 uh, and come back to you on that. But uh, what I would say is that, yes, we, we do obviously need to make sure that, that people are work ready. We do need to make sure that people have opportunities to, to be trained and to be educated. But the point I've been emphasising, I hope, from the beginning of, of my evidence here today is that uh, if, as, if we found ourselves in a situation where um, we didn't have a system in place for uh, European Union citizens to feel welcome and feel they had a future here, we would not be able to make up the shortfall uh, in many, many of the sectors that we need them in from the group of people you're talking about. It simply it is not practical to do that in the time available. Thank that you. doesn't take away from the point, the, the important point of making people work ready, though. Thanks. Thank you. If, if I could just turn again to the UK forthcoming immigration bill. I, <clears> I said at the, the start we discussed how um, your submission to the MAC, the MAC is not going to be published until next September, but the immigration bill is obviously coming out 
before then. Have you received any information or intelligence at all as to how EU citizens, new arrival EU citizens after Brexit, should it go ahead, how they will be treated in a new immigration system? So I know that the uh, Prime Minister has suggested that they will be treated the same way as EEA citizens are at the moment. Um, what's your understanding of the direction of travel in that? Well, I'm only a, a Scottish Government Minister, so I really only have leaks from the UK Government to go on, I'm afraid, on that. Um, the, the, the signs so far are, are obviously not entirely positive, um, but um, uh, at the moment, you know, we, we, we're, we're living from from month to month trying to get information um, about what, the, what is being proposed for existing EU citizens and also for, for incoming ones. But we really have nothing more to go on than the Prime Minister has, has indicated and, and none of it has been negotiated with the EU27 <coughs> to any satisfactory conclusion. One of the things that particularly concerns um, many people that uh, have engaged with the committee is the minimum income requirement for non-EEA family members in the UK at the moment. And uh, there was a report out by the Migration Observatory uh, last year that examined this issue. Um, it, it, it notes that 40% of British citizens employed in 2015 didn't meet the income criteria for uh, to sponsor a family member. But one of the very interesting things that it threw up is the gender uh, disparity and the discrimination against women in this area. Uh, for example, when you look at the number of people who are not eligible to sponsor a spouse because of their income, uh, men fall 27% of men fall into that category, but females it's 55%. And when it comes when you, when you have two children, women are even more likely to be discriminated against. It's a woman with two children, 69% of women with two children wouldn't meet the eligibility criteria to have their spouse uh, stay in the UK. That is very worrying if that applied to EU citizens. And is, it, is that gender discrimination something that concerns you? I think it is. I mean, it is from a, a human point of view. I mean, it certainly seems like a very crude way to, to try to... Um, determine the future of, of <coughs> European citizens, citizens of other European nations uh, seeking to come to our country in the future. It does appear to discriminate, as you say, uh, against women and also discriminates, it should be said, against some of the very groups, uh, some of the very sectors uh, where people are working and doing a valuable job in Scotland. There are some sectors we've mentioned, um, some sectors like agriculture and fish processing, where I'm quite sure that if the non-European rules were applied to EU citizens and EU citizens, new EU citizens or new applicants uh, for entry into the UK would find themselves falling foul of that. So at a human level, it doesn't seem to be very sensible uh, to apply those rules to EU citizens and at an economic one, it doesn't seem very sensible either. And finally, um, Ms Sunderland mentioned uh, the Camp Hill community, which is, uh, if you don't mind, I want to raise that as a constituency issue, as I have a Camp Hill community in the south of Scotland based at Loch Arthur, whom I visited on Friday, uh, and they wanted me to visit um, to raise the issue that they're concerned about, um, which is their volunteers. Uh, so. Basically, their volunteers come from Europe because they follow the Rudolf Steiner approach uh, to uh, working with people with learning disabilities. And it was an absolutely uh, humbling experience. Many people had lived there as volunteers for 20 years, uh, contributing and, and supporting <coughs> people in a very familial situation, but not drawing a wage. And because they don't draw a wage, they wouldn't fit into the income criteria going forward. Is there anything that we can do to influence the UK government to ensure that these uh, wonderful communities that do so much to help vulnerable people uh, are sustainable in future? I think that there's lots of things in that. that I mean, certainly, uh, we, we do and, and we, we will continue to, to raise the issue of, of voluntary work, um, partly because it shouldn't be overlooked that so many people from other uh, European countries contribute to their own communities and are so keen to contribute to their own uh, communities through voluntary work, but also because uh, of the uncertainty that, that surrounds so much of what's being proposed, for instance, around the five-year rule um, for, for people uh, having to prove their... their, their um, 
that they had been resident here for, for future status and settled status and so on. Uh, somebody said to me recently, someone from Spain said to me, um, well, I can prove that the time I was doing paid work, how on earth do I prove the time I was doing voluntary work? Does this count? Well, will, will this count towards my settled status or not? Mm -hmm. So the, the voluntary sector raises all sorts of questions and it's good to see that the organisations representing the, the voluntary sector in Scotland have been raising those very publicly. The Scottish Government's happy to do so too. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask a quick yes. supplementary on that point as well? I mean, have you had any sort of sounding out from the UK government really about people that are in that exact uh, position and people who are, I mean, I know that there, there's lots of examples of people who've been for it, in cash in hand employment as well, which I think, you know, offers the same, uh, the same issues. So uh, do you have any sort of sense of where the thinking is on that? No, uh, I recently took up uh, an individual case um, as Minister and I've also taken up, as I'm sure others have, uh, as a constituency MSP um, to, to try to get an answer to that question. So far, uh, I don't have an answer. There may be one in the post, but um, there is a huge wealth of detail at the moment that is missing uh, in terms of the question of how people prove um, their residence and prove um, their status for five years in order to, to qualify for, for different sort, types of settled status in the future, however those are ultimately defined. But the, pro the problem is the longer this goes on, as I probably don't need to tell you, the more uncomfortable the situation becomes and we shouldn't be putting people in that situation much longer. Okay, thank you. Ross Greer. Thanks, Kinder. Um, I noticed in having a look at the report that the government highlights an issue with the data coming from rural areas where it seems to be largely uh, qualitative. I was wondering if you could just talk us through what the issues are there. Well, I mean, some, I will, as you can probably guess, call upon help for that one. But I think, uh, if I may, I think that we do have qualitative information about the situation uh, in, in rural Scotland, which is different in a, in a number of ways. Um, for instance, uh, uh, employment levels are deceptively high in rural areas, as you'll be aware, because young people uh, who don't have jobs simply move out of the areas. Um, it doesn't take away from the fact that there is often a, an economic problem, there is often a major skill shortage. So we do have qu um, qualitative information about some of that and how that impacts upon the need for um, people from uh, other European countries living in those areas. But if I can perhaps call on one or another to come in on, on the back I'm of that. I'm happy to come in. <laughs> um, yes, um, obviously the best source of, of information we have on, on population is the census. But obviously that's only every 10 years and the census is carried out in March. So actually we're not picking up seasonal workers at all. And obviously uh, rural areas are particularly dependent on seasonal, seasonal workers, particularly for agriculture. And we have done some work looking, um, say we as a, a rural policy colleagues have done some work looking at the agricultural census to try and make an estimate of, of seasonal workers um, number of seasonal workers, and we, we are thinking it's something about 22,000, between 15 and 22,000, but it's obviously very difficult because seasonal workers are very mobile as well, uh, so they're following the work. Um, but we, uh, we, have commissioned, we have commissioned research, uh, which is actually looking in greater detail specifically at seasonal agricultural workers, and we're expecting an interim report from that next month. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Um, just to finish off, um, we talked earlier about a differentiated <coughs> system for Scotland. Now, we know that the system for non-EEA um, migrants uh, at the moment is, is our experience is very complex, our experience as MSPs, that is. Um, how could you ensure that any differentiated system for Scotland works better for businesses in the sense that it's, it's cheaper and it's, it's less complex, because clearly, you know, there are many people who have given evidence, the written evidence to our committee said they're quite open. Uh, they, they, they understand that Scotland has particular needs and they're quite open, but they want to know how it's going to work. And understandably, they want reassurances that it's not going to cost them more money if they're businesses. What kind of reassurances can you give them in that respect? I think those are, those are very fair and understandable questions uh, that businesses uh, raise and ones that we want to take into account over the next uh, months as we as we put together our proposals on this. 
Uh, I think one thing that's um, becoming clear is that there is a, a movement perhaps towards, um, even aside from any new policy, there is a movement within the UK towards businesses in a sense uh, becoming, having more of a role uh, as gatekeepers in a way around the immigration system than they used to have. Uh, we need to take account of the fact that businesses uh, may have concerns about um, the workload around that, but it does perhaps also provide us with, with opportunities and that it, I think, overcomes some of the arguments that have been thrown in the past at the idea of, of regional uh, immigration policies because it makes clear that this isn't particularly about monitoring people on sub-state borders. This is about ensuring that businesses uh, uh, can, uh, can have the workforce that they need and that uh, we can devise a policy which ensures that they have that. Um, inevitably, uh, any uh, system um, could be more complicated, perhaps not inevitably, it could end up more complicated, and we want to devise a policy that ensures that we, we avoid that situation, that we, we have a, a, a policy that's informed not just by the needs of uh, individual workers, but by businesses themselves. Thank you. Oh, Rachel Hamilton, tree on that, uh, if I may. Um, I know that some of industries had expressed concerns about the financial implications, and uh, I wondered if you, you were actually planning to uh, do some financial modelling uh, around um, devolving Im immigration, particularly for small businesses. I know that the Federation of Small Business had expressed um, concern, and particularly those small businesses without an HR department, and also the implications that um, it would have on local authorities as well. Well, certainly we would want to take into account any concerns that were brought to us about that. About that. But it should be said that, that businesses, including small businesses uh, and uh, indeed uh, the housing sector, already uh, have a role uh, in, uh, in monitoring or, 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 or dealing with some of these questions as it is. So, um, yes, we would want to take into account any concerns that people had. But the biggest concern that is being brought to us by the business world in this area isn't about that, it's about the fact that they have skill shortages that they don't know how to meet uh, if we don't have a tailored solution to this problem. Thank you. And um, we'll just draw our meeting to a close now and go into private session. Can I thank the Minister and his officials for coming to give evidence to us today? And we will now go into private session. Thank you. <laughs>